If you're looking for a video of a man lopping off heads while discussing who's winning the war in Ukraine and how you should think about answering that very question, you've come to the right place. Everybody, this is Rage Quit Travis, and I am Travis. We're here at Arid, which is the wor worst map. And I'm using my Executioner Sword, which is pretty good. I like it, and I've got a javelin. Today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I want to talk to y'all about geopolitics which is a serious matter. Uh, but it's something I've kind of spent a little bit of time studying. And something I've come across a lot since the Russo-Ukrainian War started is this, this kind of online discourse that I think is incredibly simplistic and it's often this comp you know it'll be a comment like ukraine is winning followed by a little clown emoji because emojis are what we use to communicate ideas in the modern day or it'll say you know, russia is winning and clown emoji and the implication is that those who would say such a thing are clowns. And indeed, there is something clownish about the concept of, of boiling down winning to a simple kind of binary yes or no answer in, in such a complicated topic. Who is winning is the type of question that you would say wander into a living room during a video, uh, during a, you know, football game or something, and you would ask who's winning. And you'd see the score right there, and you would know the answer to your question. Even in some wars, the concept of, of like binary, kind of who is winning, who is losing kind of thing wouldn't necessarily be ridiculous. For instance, in World War II, towards the end of either the Pacific or the European uh, wars, it would have been quite obvious that one side was winning and one side was losing. But in other wars, it is not quite so obvious as that. I think World War I would be such a war where it's not readily apparent at any given point necessarily who was winning. And I think the Russo-Ukrainian war is another such war. Because there's not a lot of movement. There's a lot of stalemate. Um, and at any one time, different sides have been gaining more ground than the other. But it has yet to result in any kind of decision. And thus, that kind of brings us to this concept of, well, how do we determine in a complex such like this, who is winning? And I don't want to try and explain to you like what I think about who's winning, but rather provide a framework for determining how to answer that question. And I think the framework that we can use there is the three levels of war, which is strategic, operational and tactical. Strategy, of course, is on its own kind of a difficult concept to define. Uh, the word strategy gets bandied about a lot. Strategic is an adjective that is significantly overused. But it's important to consider because strategy as a level of war is that which falls right under policy and policy considerations are extremely important so 
So strategy being under politics means essentially what is the actual mechanism by which you're going to attain your strategy. So I've defined it as the coordination of ends, ways, and means to achieve national end states. But if you have 13 strategists in a room, you're going to get 14 different definitions of strategy at least. So if we look, though, at just strategy as being the overall uh, concept, the kind of actions that support each side's policies, and we examine the various actions that are occurring at the strategic level, we can see a few you know, trends or, or ideas emerge. The first is what was desired at the outset of the war. I think for Russia, it was very clearly they wanted to replace the regime in Kyiv with one that was friendly to, to Russia, much like they have in Belarus, where they have kind of this union state. And clearly they failed to do that. The Russians tried to enter Kyiv rapidly, and many people thought they would succeed, but they did not succeed. So then, that was the strategic goal at the beginning of the conflict. For Ukraine's part, their strat at the you know, strategic level, their only goal was national survival, which they have also been able to maintain. Another Russian goal, allegedly, was to prevent the spread of NATO. But we currently have two Nordic countries that were previously unaligned that tried to retain their neutrality that have seemingly moved firmly into the camp of the you know, pro-United States-Europe camp. So it would seem then a, that is a strategic blow for Russia. So those are the strategic uh, considerations in determining who's winning, who's achieving what they want. However, there's also the stated intentions of the leaders, which gets a little bit more confusing because Russia's uh, articulation of their strategic goals has been a bit muddied and it's not entirely clear what they're looking to do. Um, Denazification was one thing that came up several times. Desatanification is something that certain Russian commentators brought up as their goal. But really it is probably the you know, cementing that Crimea is, is part of Russia, and then retaining the land bridge between the Donbass region and Crimea. And those are kind of stated, but also the, the stated intentions of denazification are very important ambiguous, but I think the idea of securing a land bridge is implied. And then Kiev, for, say, Zelensky's part, obviously wants to remain as a sovereign entity, which is easy enough to, to uh, understand. But then you also have the desire to retake all of the lands that were occupied by Russia. So that's another stated goal. So does winning then mean achieving all those objectives? Does winning mean achieving some of the strategic objectives? If Russia manages to prevent the spread, or 
if Russia does manage to install its own regime in Kyiv, but NATO has expanded, does that mean Russia wins or loses? Does it have a tie? So these things are different to say. And just because you're winning in one area doesn't mean you're winning in another. You can have an operational victory, but ultimately leave, lose in some strategic aspect. So that's that's how to think about it at the strategic level. And you can already see it's more complex than a simple yes or no. When you try to think who is winning. Then we got the operational level, which is difficult to analyze because it doesn't exist. It's not real. It's a fairy tale. Something that uh, history courses have made up, um, just like uh, the Tooth Fairy. Or at least that's the argument that B.A. Friedman makes in his book on operations, which is a good book and one I recommend reading. But he basically makes the army argument that there is no operational level of war and that the supposed history that an understanding of the operational level of war comes from, uh, the historical basis is mistranslated from the original Soviet theorist, which is very eye-opening. I think he makes a, a, good, a good argument for the operational level of war not really being a useful concept, hard to define, um, and not particularly useful when it is defined. But what would the operational level of war consist of if it were real? Logistics is one thing, manpower, personnel, the coordination of those elements, uh, ammunition, supplies, uh, the use of of tactics strung together for the purpose of an objective basically something like the counteroffensive that we're seeing now of course a single counteroffensive can fail and not alter the course of the war for instance the Wehrmacht won a lot of operations at the beginning of World War II and ultimately lost the war. So you can't really say that the operational level matters all that much in the grand scheme of things if the strategic end, end state is really what matters the most. And to really examine you know, Russia versus Ukraine at the operational level, you need a lot of, I think, nitty-gritty details that I think other people have probably tried to put together um, that I don't have time to discuss in the range of a short Mordhau video. And then finally, we have the tactical level. If you don't understand what the tactical level is, this is a good example of tactics. I mean, the tactical level of war is anything from... from the you know infantry rifle team to maybe battalions brigades divisions um, in reality the tactical level is I think bigger than a lot of people think and be but it's still small it's still a small scale and ultimately wars are not won or lost at the tactical level you can win every battle of a, of a war and still lose if your strategic result is not met. See Vietnam, the United States and Vietnam. What you can't do is overcome bad strategy with tactics. Um, so the tactical, the tactical realm is not really where, in my opinion, you examine who's winning or losing. 
because then you know you're just counting up individual losses, uh, equipment losses, but that has to be put into a bigger picture in order to make any sense of it. So this is all to say that this idea of who's winning, who's losing, is a it's a complicated thing to you know figure out. But peeling apart those questions, yeah, as you would an onion, is the right way to approach things. Not just looking at things literally, but uh, from a more you know, complex kind of way, a systemic way of looking at them. I'm surrounded by people. So anyway, those are my thoughts. I'm gonna listen back back to that and see if it sounds like insane ramblings. It probably does, but I just, you know, I get tired of uh, seeing a simplistic approach to discussions of warfare because I think it's an immensely important topic even for civilians. Because in a nuclear age where war can spiral into a complete global nuclear exchange, it's very important to understand these kind of underlying functions, even if you're not a soldier or a policymaker. I have studied deterrence so much in my own personal, you know, professional reading because it's just too important. The stakes are too high. Wait. This person is abusing animations like you wouldn't believe. But no more. Now that's a drag and a half. Should probably go to sleep. I think I'm just gonna play until this next one, uh, this next either objective gets accomplishments or the seven minutes is up. Where is the enemy team? Now I've become the one that does all the drags. That becomes the thing I hated. Stabbing these superhumans. You gotta look, look around. You gotta look, look at what you're doing. Oh, cavalry 
it's a spear. At this point, I'm actually excited for this match to be over because I'm just tired. It's been a long day. But the horse got in the way. Caused his own death. in three minutes. I thought I wanted to play Mordhau forever. I realized I just wanted to sleep. Anyway, I'm done. I'll see y'all later. <laughs>